Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Twenty-six minutes to twelve is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where imminently I will introduce you to the Conservative Member of Parliament, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who is just being led into the studio as we speak, and subsequently you can then ask him whatever questions you would like um, pertinent to the looming referendum. As you know, the um, well, Judgment Day is almost upon us, and Jacob Rees-Mogg has been a prominent campaigner for the Leave side of the debate. Um, and that's why he's here. So, uh, you know the number by now, 0345 uh, I think in the interest of fairness, we should probably say a few words of greeting before we expose you to the switchboard, Jacob. So, thank you for coming in today. Are you, are you worried about what is going to happen to your party, regardless of what the result is on June the 23rd? No, I'm not. I think that on either side people will accept the result. My main motive for wanting us to leave is democracy. And if the voters blow a raspberry at me, I must accept that. On the other hand, if we vote to leave, then I would expect that to be implemented in an efficient manner. And, and yet, perhaps it's fair to say some of your colleagues are, are a little more rancorous than you. Well, that's often what people say in the heat of a campaign. But after a campaign, there's so much that Conservatives agree about. The basic philosophy of Conservatism and wanting to keep Jeremy Corbyn out of number 10 Downing Street is an important motive as well. So I can see us coming back together fairly soon afterwards, though inevitably some people will be feeling more bruised than others. Uh, uh, under the same leadership? Under the same leadership. You think David Cameron's position is completely safe, even in the event of, of your side prevailing? Nobody's position is ever completely but you, safe, you know but, but, I mean. but within reason, yes, I think it's safe. And actually, I think it's quite important he stays in the event of Brexit, because the first thing we then need to do is to have a really big diplomatic push with our friends in Europe to make clear that the differentiation is that it's the EU we don't like, not Europe, and that we want to cooperate in a friendly way with our European neighbours. And David Cameron's best place to do that because he's worked with them now for many years. He knows all the individual heads of state and of government, and that diplomatic effort would be best led by him, in my view. Uh, and also, that hadn't occurred to me before, he, 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 he will turn up, if he loses, in a very different humour, or, or, or he'll be treated very differently by other European leaders from somebody who perhaps has led us out, he would almost perhaps enjoy some sympathy from them because he'll be trying to get a deal that he never wanted to have to be trying to get in the first place. And they might feel a little guilty for not having given him anything in the renegotiation. They might have felt that had they been a little bit more generous in February, they might not be facing uh, Brexit in um, June. Mr Cameron, of course, would contend that he secured plenty during that renegotiation. I, I, I find it little. Um, and the Downing Street cat might agree, but I'm not sure anyone else would. Uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, already in characteristically bullish form. Let's get to the phones. Daniel is in West Hampstead. What would you like to ask Mr Rees-Mogg, Daniel? Good morning, James, and good morning, Jacob. Um, my question is, uh, we've heard a lot of scaremongering from the Remain camp, um, from David Cameron, um, from other, other politicians, uh, scaring, effectively scaring us, saying that if we were to leave the European Union, our trade would, would be severely affected and we're going to recession. My question is, um, we take three countries, Norway, Iceland, and Switzerland. Um, Norway and Iceland are in the EEA, EEA the European Economic Area, and Switzerland isn't, but it's in the European free trade area. If we left the EU, what would our trade situation, or what would Britain's economy look like if we were to become, uh, like Norway and Iceland, a member of the European economic area? Why did we not do that? Well, first of all, on the scare stories, I think it's very important to remember that David Cameron volunteered to take us into this referendum, and a week before he completed his renegotiation said he was ruling nothing out. If at that point he really believed that leaving the EU could lead to third world war or a Brexit recession, to quote Faisal Islam, um, he was being thoroughly irresponsible in suggesting he might lead the Leave campaign. So I think we should discount the scare stories. Uh, the difficulty with simply joining the EEA is that it has the free movement of people. And I think one of the big issues in this campaign is actually having control of our borders. This is not being unfriendly to uh, migrants, it's being fair 
to migrants from all over the world and recognizing that somebody coming from India could be just as valuable as somebody coming from uh, Italy. So joining the EEA may not be the answer, but in terms of getting a, a free trade deal or, or um, access to the European market, this is really what Article 50 is all about, um, or the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And there's an excellent report by the House of Lords European Committee explaining that that was introduced to minimize the economic shock for both sides, because we're the biggest customer of the European Union if we're outside it. We have a deficit that at current monthly rates is running at 100 million pounds a year. So, so many European Union industries are dependent on us buying and nobody would want to lose that. Is there a country, Daniel, you, you were presumably aware of that, were you? The, the, the fact that signing up on sort of Norway style EAA terms would involve the free movement of people continuing? Yes, um, I, I did know there are certain conditions under which well, that, that's, that's um, so pretty huge. have access to the internal market, yes. to the single market. Is, is there, so you're comfortable with that? You don't mind the free, you, you're not one of the people who sees this debate as being first, last and always really about immigration, about the movement of people. You'd be comfortable to restore or regain um, what is often described as sovereignty or which Jacob has called democracy. Perfectly comfortable to see the, 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 the ebb and flow of people across borders continue pretty much as it is now. Absolutely, because it's two way, and I think, and I, and I think it's, it's, I think from the Leave camp, people on the Leave side, I think it's disingenuous not to acknowledge the benefit which the UK does get from um, European immigration, and it is two way. So, but, but what I do think, what I'm very much against, is the is the political interference. That's what I don't like. The the political interference from Brussels, the EU directive. Um, I used to work in in the financial sector. And there's a huge amount of financial regulation. Not, not that it's not needed, some of it is, but there is a huge amount of very costly bureaucracy in terms of EU regulations and directives, which I don't think we should be a part of. And, and when I, as a layman, when it comes to matters financial, as my wife would attest, when I say, wasn't the last massive collapse caused in part by lax regulation? Uh, no, it, it, it's it's very simplistic to say that, James. It wasn't. You can have, you know, look, <laughs> as I said, in part. You can have all the complicated bits as well. But it was caused in part by lax regulation and poor scrutiny, which the EU is keen to address, isn't it? In in some aspects, yes, but it's not the answer. The an the answer is not to cripple and overload businesses with huge amounts of regulation, yes. which is sort of centrally administered um, directives. Now, what what I wouldn't mind is if if we had more, you know, perhaps more sensible regulation from the UK. I think it's 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 insulting to have all these directives from Brussels when you know the UK should really be the ones in charge of it. D D Daniel makes some excellent points. Is there a country, Jacob, that you would point out as an example, if, if people listening to this are more concerned than he is about the migration issue, is there a country that we can point out as, as, as a sort of uh, target or, or, or one we could seek to emulate well, in our deal? Most countries trade with the European Union without having the free movement of people. Um, indeed, since we joined, the US has grown its trade with the EU faster than we have. So being in the EU and having free movement is not necessarily essential to our growth in trade. But the key to my mind is control, as Daniel's saying, and it, it's ensuring that we get the best people from around the world. I accept that we are going to need people to come into this country, we always have done, and they make a contribution to our economy. But that there was a report in today's Financial Times saying the number of um, highly qualified students from the rest of the world who've been coming to um, UK business schools who stay on has halved. But that's because of a conservative policy, it's, that's not because it, of EU membership. It's because it's the only bit we can control. And the country at large... But, but it is because of it. it was a specific well, conservative policy introduced by the current Prime Minister. It has nothing to do with the EU membership. No, no, the EU membership is essential to this. You're absolutely right, it's been introduced domestically, but the absolute heart of it is that some control has to be held over your immigration numbers. You can't have completely open borders. If one part is a free-for-all, then the regulations you have on the other part become unduly onerous. And that's the problem that we've got now. I see. And, and it is true, though, that the current levels, there are more people coming here from non-EU countries and there are coming here from EU countries. Well, that depends on whether you believe the ONS standing at the airport and asking people why they've come, or you look at the national insurance numbers, where you saw that 610,000 numbers were issued to EU nationals in one year. And there's been no proper explanation as to whether that is the real number, because obviously if you come and work, you have to get a national insurance number. Uh, well, the part of the explanation was the difference between people coming to work for a season and people coming to live forever. Uh, yes, but we don't have any 
any evidence that they leave. They haven't been counted out because we don't have any uh, checks and people leave. And um, similarly with non-EU migrants as well. Um, well, non-EU migrants, we assume, stick to their visa conditions. Yes. So there is a problem of illegal immigration, but that's relatively small compared to legal migration. Um, uh, Hassan in Slough is up next. Hassan, you're talking to Jacob rees -Mogg. Hi, morning, Jacob. Good morning. Um, now, uh, I'm, a, I'm a conservative myself, but I will be voting to, to remain. Uh, and, and the reason is this, that um, if we ask ourselves uh, which chancellors in recent history were able to turn our economy around, uh, they were Ken Clark and George Osborne. And both are saying that uh, we'll be better to, to remain. I mean, they would do, um, they, they would certainly support British interests and they, they wouldn't do anything that, that would damage Britain. Uh, as evidenced by, by, by their policies. Um, so, don't you think we should actually defer to their judgment uh, and, and remain? Well, I, I have the greatest respect for both of them as chancellors, but I still think that Nigel Lawson was a better chancellor than either of them, who fundamentally reformed our economy, and he's for leave. Um, but um, Ken Clark, who is an absolutely admirable man, really first-class politician, uh, and was a very good chancellor, he benefited from the collapse of our European policy in 1992. And one of the things that led to our astonishingly good economic performance in the 1990s was that we came out of the exchange rate mechanism, and again, we were able to take control, that we were able to have an economic policy for the United Kingdom rather than being tied into a European Union model. So I think the evidence is that the less Europe you have in your economy, the better you do. No, thanks for that. Yeah, the problem in the 90s was uh, we were linked to the uh, euro, so that, that, that's not the issue here. Um, but I just hope that um, the to answer one of your questions, James, before was what's going to happen to the Tory party after this. And I hope we can actually unite because I've actually witnessed uh, the damage that the rebels had actually done in 1997 when they brought down John Major's government and we had three terms of Tony Blair. I certainly don't want to see one term of uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Hassan, thank you very much. Um, Jacob rees -Mogg, can you guarantee 100% that Nigel Lawson uh, will still be able to live in France after a Brexit? Uh, rights that people have under the treaties that they are exercising whilst the treaties are in force maintain, are maintained after the treaties are abandoned. Yes. And the same would apply to everybody and living the same here would apply. Now. That's very important. Yes, it is. Anyone who is living here has established a right to live here lawfully and nobody in their right mind would even suggest that they would be expected to leave. Well, that's a little harsh on people who have suggested it. Uh, well, um, I hope nobody has. I mean, I th I've always thought that deportation of legal uh, migrants would be a wicked policy. But if, if I wanted to follow Nigel Lawson's lead and retire to the south of France, I may struggle. It would be under a different regime, but the French may still want you, because a rich <laughs> gentleman can't. like you, you know, they'd like your money. <laughs> well, uh, these things are relative. It's 11.46, more from Jacob Rees-Mogg after this. James O'Brien on LBC. Call 0345 6060 Ten minutes to twelve is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, joined by Jacob Rees-Mogg, prominent Leave campaigner in the looming referendum. Um, and uh, the questioning so far has been done almost entirely by you, so long may it continue. Let's go to Mark, who's in Milton Keynes. Mark, what would you like to say? Hi, James and Jacob. Hello. Um, is, well, we haven't been allowed to see the EU accounts by the EU because they haven't published them, but at the same time, the UK haven't published what money's going out and coming back into this country, going to certain organisations. At the same time, some of those certain organisations that receive money have been saying, oh, we've got to remain. And also, the ex-EU, um, uh, I don't know what they're called, the people that are in the, in the parliament have their pension, pensions, so they're also held by the fact that if they say they want to uh, leave, they will lose their pensions. Is this true? I'm going to have to ask you to distill that question down ever so slightly if you can, Mark. Is what true, precisely? Um, some of the people that are now on pensions that have worked for the EU um, are not allowed to say they, they want to leave because they would lose their pension. Where, where did you get that information from? Well, that's what I've heard. I'm, I'm trying to, I suppose, confirm it. I was just wondering what the source is, because it's not something yeah, I've heard. because we're not allowed to see the accounts at all in any way, shape or form. They've been signed off, they've the, been audited every year since 2007. Yeah, but we're not allowed to see the full accounts. You, you want to go through the paperwork? Yeah, it, it should be published. If I go to a council or a district council, I can see, see the accounts. And so the question is, is it true that people who've worked for the EU aren't allowed to offer up anti-EU positions in case they lose their pensions? Yes. I don't know if Jacob can answer it, that. Have you, I, I'm not familiar with this story. In general. Okay. 
Um, there, there is a, a broad requirement that people who receive contracts from the EU or uh, receive other payments from the EU must not say something that is damaging to the reputation of the European Union. And then the question is whether saying you should leave the European Union because it's a failed state would damage the EU's um, reputation. Uh, and that would become a, a legal case. I imagine it would go to the European Court of Justice. But uh, I think Mark's fear is founded on fact, but that you can't be certain of how a judgment would go. The fact being, the fact being, this, is if this guidance received, in place. What, that's about right, yeah. what about the budget? What about what? I mean, it's, it's an old ambition, Mark. I, I accept its validity, but to, to want to pull through every page of the of the EU accounts. Well, many well, are we allowed to? Aren't we allowed to see the accounts of of <laughs> other government organisations? You know, this this one's losing at least two percent apparently in corruption, but two percent in corruption it, it amounts to at least five billion. And you'd want to see more of that. You, you I mean because the, the, oh, yeah, the, the one hundred and thirty three point six billion pounds last year were, were apparently affected by material error. But it is the official auditors that tell us that. And I'm not sure, unless I've misunderstood you, you're sort of simultaneously as suggesting that we can't trust them, but but the numbers they're giving us are cause for concern. They, they are, of course, concerned. There are organisations that have had their accounts record audited in this country, yes. and then questions have been asked about the auditors. But it's, as I say, it's just I'd like to know the facts. Where is all the money going, and also the money going back into this country? There's organisations, say, as the CBI, they, they're saying, oh, we've got to remain, and then it turns out they're getting money from the EU. Or from the UK government, you know, by and, the and yeah, I understand you perfectly. So the problem this creates is that any organisation, and it's going to include pretty much every university, I I the IFS, various other organisations, are simply by the way the country works and the union works, are going to have been in receipt at some point of research grants from the European Union. So Mark's concern is that anybody who says we should remain must be actually almost corrupt. It, it's a very difficult problem. I. I've always admired the IFS, but I was shocked to discover that they get 10% of their funding from the European Union, because it, when you get money from the European Union, you do have to sign up to contracts that say you won't do anything to bring it into disrepute. And 10% of any business's funding is a very important amount of, uh, of money. So it is a real issue, and the CBI carries out surveys for the EU for which it gets handsomely paid uh, and signs similar contracts. And th this has been an issue in this debate, that we've had a lot of experts tell us what they think, but not very many of them tell them whether, as whether they've got a conflict of interest. And in, in my view, conflicts of interest are best dealt with by declaration. Um, that if you find out later that somebody's been taking money from the EU, then you raise suspicions in your mind. If when they issue their report, they say, this is our report, this is our view, but by the way, we do have a conflict of interest, that level of de declaration I always think is reassuring, but sadly, very few people make it. The Bank of England, you, you called for the resignation of the governor of the Bank of England. That would be for reasons different from the ones that, that you cite in objecting to organisations like the IFS or the CBI. It would, because the Bank of England broke its normal policy of neutrality in political events, that the Bank of England does not make forecasts on the basis of the opposition's policy in a general election. It doesn't look at, uh, or didn't look at Ed um, Balls's economic policy and say what it thought this would do. On the other hand, it decided to speculate about what would happen if we left the European Union. Uh, and this seemed to me entirely improper, that the independence of the Bank of England requires it to make estimates on what government policy is, not speculatively on what government policy may become. That's a deeply political approach, and I think it was beneath the dignity of the Bank of England to get involved in the weeds of a political debate. And yet, of course, uh, for, for people undecided or people uh, on the outside of the argument, it, it would begin to sound as if anybody who, who comes out with pro remain arguments is in your view compromised what well, what the bank of england did was look at really two possible case scenarios and, and explain which one they preferred is that impartial um it's not the job of the bank of england to do that that is a political matter the bank of england does not it's, it's not it's a finance an economic no, they look no. at two specific scenarios and say which one mm. will affect the pound that assumes that economic forecasts are fact rather than theory and it doesn't uh, it does. It, it really does. There's no such thing as a factual forecast. That's absolutely right. And therefore you are speculating on a political choice. And in your speculation, you must be influenced by the choice that you are looking towards. If you could say... Yeah, well, that, that's the interesting point, Jacob, isn't it? Because that, that is what I was alluding to when I said, uh, you, under what I'm hearing from you now, it's impossible for anybody on the Remain side to be impartial. Um, 
Well, if you're on, the, but the Bank of England shouldn't be on the Remain side. The Bank of England should be impartial, and it's come it out for both. the Remain side. No, I don't think that's that, my point. I, 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 I would dispute your point. I think that uh, if you are an impartial body, you have to rise above that impartiality. Actually, I think the IFS is an impartial body, and it made a mistake in not saying it was EU funded at the point it announced its report. So you think that their report is is good, is accurate, you just wish no, that No, they... I, I don't think it's accurate because the assumptions it makes are okay. ones that I would dispute. It, it assumes that if we left the EU we would put tariffs on uh, imports from the EU, which I think is absolutely balmy. I don't think any sensible person would do that. So I think there are flaws in the methodology, but I don't think the IF... I, I think the IF has made a mistake in its reputational terms by not announcing it received funding from the EU as it uh, revealed its report. We should do this more often. Well, I'm um, delighted. <laughs> George is in Southampton. George, what would you like to say? Well, I'd like to ask, oh, good, good, uh, good afternoon. I'd like to ask a question. The EU Commission was supposed to make a, a statement before the referendum, and they put that off until after the referendum. Has the EU seemed very keen for us to stay in? Do you think there's been some shenanigans going on to put this back? Likewise, with the registration was extended, because the Remain thought, oh, we get more youngsters who to vote late. Well, to, to, to be fair, George, I mean, you're perfectly entitled to your interpretation of events, but the registration was extended because the system broke in the, in the, in yeah, the closing yeah, hours did, of... Uh, did it break, or was it... Yes, it did. I, I think there's some great questions okay, you're asking. Okay, I'll accept that. Yeah. I apologise for that. But on the, on the other part, when they put this, the Commission said they're not going to say anything until after the referendum. If they're being so keen on England to Britain to stay in, you'd, and if it was going to be something adv advantageous to it, they'd have been shouting out about it. Do you not think that? I think they've gone very quiet during this campaign yeah. because they don't want to uh, upset us. I think that... Well, that's um, a good thing, surely. If, if Well, they will come out on the 24th of June, so we don't have the chance to, to vote on them. Sure. We know that, right. that a report on a European army is in a dusty drawer waiting to come out afterwards. We've yeah. seen in... Except it's not a European army, though, is it? It's, 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 it's a pooling of resources. No, it's a European army, okay. and it's, it's being proposed under enhanced cooperation, which requires no more than nine countries and they fewer than nine countries to go ahead and then they can do it under the EU auspices and then other countries can join or not. So you've found yeah. a European army without the UK in it and then we find eventually that we're dragged in. Uh, but crucially... We'd have a power of veto though. We'd have a power of not joining ourselves yes. but you don't have a power of veto over enhanced cooperation. Well we wouldn't it, have that if we left. No, we wouldn't have that if we left, but if we leave, we're not going to be drawn into a European army. Which we don't have to be drawn into if we stay. Uh, the um, European institutions are used to fund enhanced cooperation. So, so we, we might end up, end up paying for we something, that we, don't paying for something that we don't want to be part of. There we go, George. Is that a satisfactory answer? Yeah, oh, well, there's one little bit about it. It's about... Well, I'm late for the news. It was, it was a kind of a rhetorical question, George. I don't know. <laughs> what they're going to tell us. Um, I, I think that's a question about Turkey and this um, leaked letter from one diplomat that the Sunday Times had on the front page yesterday that has been, I think, fairly roundly dismissed by everybody in government. Well, they would, wouldn't they? I think it's a really important story that the government, without telling us, was developing quite serious plans between diplomats. One letter of one diplomat well, to another. But, do, are, are our diplomats so wild that they run off making random policy suggestions without any guidance from their political masters? I'm very suspicious of the government's denials. Jacob Rees-Mogg, it's been a pleasure. I almost wish we had more referendums so we could get you into the studio to take calls more often. Have you got any other pet subjects that you'd like to come in and, and discuss with my listeners? I, I think after the referendum people will think I've said quite enough. <laughs> Nonsense. Uh, it's just turned 12 noon. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. 